So yeah, I'm going to talk about the composable enterprise, and it's really interesting. So we have uh, coming up a speaker, uh, Miko, who I know a long time, and I was chatting to him before, and he said, I'm going to talk about biological metaphors today, and, and I have some biological metaphors, and, and um, at school I hated biology. I loved the sciences. I loved maths, physics, chemistry, but biology, no. And I, I think it's just because it was so complex. Do you know what I mean? Maths was just beautiful and simple, and once you, once you knew it, you, you didn't have to know a lot of stuff. You just had to, you could work it out. I, I remember a, a, someone told me about their professor at um, a, a physics professor at, in their first year at university. And you know, one of the questions they always have in, in classes is, will we get a, a list of formula in the exam? Will we have a formula sheet to help us? And, um, and the, they also, all the first years asked the professor, will we get a formula sheet in the exam? And he's like, oh, don't worry, it'll be fine. A and then they get into the exam, there's no formula sheet, right? And afterwards, they're like, sir, sir, why, why is there no formula sheet? He says, you can just work them all out from first principles, <laughs> right? Uh, but biology, you can't do that. So why am I saying this? Well, I, I think biology is actually much, much more useful in our industry because we deal with complexity, right? Complexity is our challenge. And, and biology is the study of complexity. So that's why I think biology is interesting, and, and you'll see some biological metaphors in my talk, and maybe that's also where Miko gets his, some of his, his inspiration from. Chavan presented this slide, and what this slide is talking about is the fact that over the last 50 years, we've seen the world disaggregating and creating smaller and smaller components. And, and I think this is an inevitable move. And I, this, I lived through this. So in the 80s, I had my first job as a student working for IBM. And I was helping build the first uh, client server system that IBM did in the UK. And we didn't even call it client server. It was predated that. It was half running on the mainframe and half running on a PC. And we had some weird adapter in the back of the mainframe, in the back of the PC that plugged into a coax cable and talked to the mainframe. And then we saw, you know, web services, SaaS, APIs, and now, of course, we see serverless and microservices. Now, why is this inevitable? I mean, why is this happening? It's not just happening because it's fun for developers. Right? It is fun for developers. Is it? But there's, there's more reasons. And, and the, 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 there are two real drivers for this disaggregation. The first driver is that we need to deliver capabilities faster. We need to build new function, build new websites, build new web pages, build new applications, new APIs faster. And it turns out that it's much easier to do that when you're recombining small components than when you're building one massive monolith. So that, that drive to build stuff faster is inevitably forcing us to build smaller reusable components. But then there's a second drive, and, and so who, who here uses AWS, right? Who here has a large AWS bill? Yeah. And we all noticed, didn't we, how quickly our AWS bill got quite large. And the, f the first thing we spotted when Kubernetes came out was we could rebuild that workload, redeploy it as a set of components in containers, and we could suddenly pack a lot more of those containers into the same number of instances on AWS and save ourselves a lot of money. So that ability to take small components and pack them more tightly is a, is a real benefit in reducing cost and scaling more. So those two drivers are making us do this, this decomposition. And that's creating complexity. That's creating more and more complexity, and I think we need more and more models to help us deal with that. And one of the big, most important models for dealing with that is APIs. 
So APIs simplify the connection between components, and they standardize the connection through those components. Because if you have a well-defined interface with a swagger or a gRPC protobuf definition, or uh, there's a new standard called async AP API, all of these things help you give you some stability and some, and some simplicity. And I think Randy Hefner from Forrester, who's their lead analyst on APIs, really captured this well. He says, basically, we can't predict the future. The only thing we know is that we have constant change. And APIs are your way of adapting to that change. And so what does that mean? What that fundamentally means is that every developer is an integration developer. Now, of course, every generalization is wrong. <laughs> right? Just think about that one for a minute. That's a good one, isn't it? Sorry, I did, I did philosophy at university, so I love these kind of little puzzles. So, of course, I'm wrong. Not every developer is an integration developer, but you would be amazed at how many developers are integration developers. So, you know, the one space, right, where, where this didn't used to be true was embedded systems. You know, you'd say, oh, I work on embedded systems. I just build. And, of course, now they're all IoT. Every embedded system developer is using MQTT or, or co-op to connect to remote systems and do networking. Every, every developer who's building an application these days, if they're not building a microservice or calling a microservice, they're certainly calling an API or a SaaS app. They're no longer building code that just lives in one VM, lives in one memory space. That is really the unusual case. So this is the world we live in. Now, a few years ago, we were kind of like, uh, integration, it's not so sexy anymore, is it? You know, it's, not so, it's not the cool thing to be doing anymore because you know, now everyone's doing cloud development and big data and AI and machine learning and stuff. But it turns out that integration is absolutely fundamental to what every developer is doing. And we see this as our mission in life. Is, you know, we, we understand integration. We understand APIs. We've been doing this for, for 14 years successfully for thousands of customers. And, and we, we believe that we have so, something significant to add in this space. And what's really important for developers is flow. So there's a, a Hungarian... <laughs> Uh, called something like Cherestinsky, and I cannot pronounce it or, or even spell it. Uh, and this, this, uh, this psychologist wrote an amazing book about flow. So who, who's a programmer here? Any, any programmers? Who enjoys programming? Right? Why do you enjoy programming? You enjoy programming because you get into this flow state. You get into this flow state where you are creating something, testing it, debugging it, improving it, and it, it's, it's like it's addictive. It creates endorphins in your brain, and it's great fun. That's why you all put your hands up. Anyone not a programmer in the room? You should try it. It's fun. <laughs> and what do programmers hate? Programmers hate not getting into that flow state. Right? And... What, what interrupts that flow state? I don't know why this button isn't working. It's, this, is, this is interrupting my flow state. and I'm <laughs> So the wrong technology stack interrupts flow. So, and unfortunately, who's to blame for that? Well, I am. Right? I, I put my hand up here. I helped build the ESB first at IBM and then at WSO2. And we built a, a product that, that predated this effective, efficient developer thing. We were building a product that, that helped you use config over code because code was inefficient. People did not have the development tools, the CI, CD pipelines, the fast deployment. And so people were taking years to deploy a new version of their monolith. And we said, oh, we can come in with a config-based model and be much quicker. 
Unfortunately, they overtook us, right? Code overtook config. And, and so that is what Ballerina is about. We've built the first programming language that's fundamentally built around APIs. So every other programming language, even the most modern, even like Go and Rust, even the core languages, take this concept that you have the core of the language and then you have I.O. Right? And networking is just a kind of I.O. And there's this famous thing called the fallacies of distributed computing, which is that people treat that I.O. and that networking as just an, a, a local call, and it isn't. And you're always trying to sort of hide the fact that we're doing a network call or bury it because I.O. is fundamentally a different thing from the core. Ballerina has taken the idea that we're going to start from the concept we're building a network program. We're going to start from that use case and say, well, what would happen if we built a language around that? So the first thing we always do in a project with a customer is we draw a sequence diagram. So a sequence diagram captures the interactions between the different parties. So we built the core of Ballerina around a sequence diagram. So the language generates the diagram, and you can edit the diagram, and that generates language. They're always in sync, and every program can be represented by a sequence diagram. So this program here, this 27 lines of code, creates a restful listener that that when it gets in a message, sends a, twi a tweet to Twitter, gets all the credentials required to call Twitter, and then, when it, and then when that works, it responds back to the client over HTTP. So here's the client, you make the request, it sends the tweet, gets the response back, and then it responds back to the client. And these annotations here basically deploy this into Kubernetes, so that generates all the container file you need, and all the Kubernetes YAML to deploy this, right? Now, if you're not a Kubernetes developer, you won't realize that that's just saved you writing 100 lines of YAML. If you're not a Java developer, this won't, you won't realize that's saved you writing 300 lines of Java. So this is a very expressive language that really captures the intent very concisely, both graphically and in code. I'm not a big graphic guy. I don't like using graphical tools much. I like writing the code. But I do like seeing the picture. I think that's very, very valuable. And we just had a, uh, a bit of a party because we launched the 1.0 uh, about a month ago today. Uh, I, was in, I was at ApacheCon. Uh, doing the announcement, and, and we had an amazing response there. We had a, we had a really uh, packed session uh, for the announcement. But more importantly, we had a hackathon for two days, and we had about 25 people come and spend most of their ApacheCon time, that they spent a lot of money buying a ticket to ApacheCon, and they all got really excited and started writing connectors and extensions to, to Ballerina and spent two days in, our, in the hackathon. So that's very exciting. And to, as, as we said, today we just released the new version of our Enterprise Integrator product. And our Enterprise Integrator product, so, so firstly, a big round of applause to Kasson, who's the product manager, and, and was up all night making sure this happened. And this is our supported release of how you can get Ballerina and use it in production from us. But it also incorporates our, our best attempt to solve those problems of developer flow if you do like a low-code ESB experience. So what we've done is to transform all the problems of a traditional ESB, which are centralized deployment, uh, long boot-up times, complex CI-CD integration, by saying you can build this into a, into a new cloud-native Dockerized deployment. And finally, we also see a big trend in, in streaming integration and real-time integration and event-based integration, and that's our CIDI runtime. And all of these runtimes work together 
They all work in Dockerized Kubernetes environments. And so they're basically providing our best knowledge of how to solve those problems that, that are there that interrupt developer flow uh, into the integration world. And so those, those capabilities help you build APIs. And why are APIs important? So fundamentally, APIs are business capabilities delivered over the internet. But what is really important in our mind are managed APIs. So managed APIs are subscribable, you can find them, you can secure them, and you can monitor and monetize them. And what does that make them? That basically makes them the products of the 21st century. So these are the way products are delivered in the 21st century, and that's why you, know, you walk around San Francisco and you see Lob advertising the fact that they have APIs for sale, because that, that's their product, right? They're putting up an ad for their product, because that's what it is. And we're seeing an amazing trend, which is we're seeing pr those products become fungible and, and, and reusable, remarketable, resellable. So, you know, about 5,000 years ago, you know, the Phoenicians started sailing across the Mediterranean in little boats. And what they would do is they would take, you know, something from North Africa to Italy and something from Italy to North Africa and basically enable trade. And so we're kind of in that stage with APIs. At the moment, most APIs are directly consumed by, the, by somebody from the person who provides it. Right? So Lob has an address checking API that they're advertising all around San Francisco. So you need to check an address. You go directly to Lob. But what we're seeing, for example, in open banking in Europe, is people creating aggregation APIs. So we worked with a subsidiary of Santander. And Santander, this subsidiary is called Asto, and they've built a, a mobile app. And you can use it not particularly with Santander bank accounts, but with anyone's bank account because of open banking. And what they're doing is basically saying, well, we can enable invoicing for you. And because we're putting, you're putting your invoices through our mobile app, it's, it's first, it's making it much easier to do your invoices. But secondly, we can now improve the offering of, of loans against those invoices. So this is what a lot of people do to improve their cash flow. They, they get a loan against the invoice from their bank. They get working capital saying, well, I've got this invoice. It's due in 90 days. Give me some money now, and I can carry on running my business. And they can basically automate that and apply AI to that. So you get quicker, faster, more accurate loans without having to submit any paperwork to the bank, without having to go through a whole load of palaver. You just download their app, start putting your invoices through it, and suddenly you've got more cash on hand. So that's an example. We also work with a company called Appigate. Appigate take a set of APIs and re bundle them together and resell them to cell phone providers. So for example, they, they have a set of APIs around mobile wallets and so forth. And they take those APIs from multiple parties and they resell them to people like AT&T and Verizon. Except they're working mainly in Southeast Asia, in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia. So they take a cut of the revenue and then they pass it back to the people who provided those original APIs. So they're kind of like a Phoenician, right? They're, they've got their little boat and they're taking a whole bunch of stuff from different suppliers and selling it on. Now, oh, that's nice. A new version of Java is available. Is it possible to kill that on my window here? This isn't my machine. I do have Java on my machine. but um, So now what's really cool is there's also a company called Orange. Right? And Orange runs a hub in the Middle East. And now Appigate sells their bundle to Orange, who sells it to cell phone to sell providers in the Middle East. So now there's a three-way revenue split, right? 
So the, the cell company in Saudi Arabia pays Orange. Orange takes a slice, passes it to Applegate, who takes a slice, who then distributes the money back to the original providers. So that's a real massive change in the way this industry is moving. So we're doing research in my team on how we can use a blockchain to enable these these marketplaces and these distributed decentralized models in a way that we can uh, pass that, track that revenue and share it backwards. So uh, as Siobhan said, we, we currently have API version 2.6. Uh, this month we're going to be shipping API Manager 3.0. Again, it's the real focus here is much better integration into Kubernetes and into decentralized distributed environments. So we have a Kubernetes operator for API Manager. We uh, have a new developer portal built on React.js. And we have a set of uh, much better containerization for this. So it makes it much, much easier to deploy it in a CI CD pipeline. We also have this micro gateway, which is a developer first uh, gateway for enabling you to build boundaries around your targets. So I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Now, of course, when you do APIs, you need security. And that's absolutely essential. And I have two book covers up here, both written by uh, or co-authored uh, or authored by Prabath. Prabath sitting at the back there. Prabath is widely known in the identity industry as a leading <coughs> Uh, a leading light and leading uh, expert on not only API security, microservices security, distributed federated identity. And he leads our, he's basically the CTO of our identity and security capability. Um, and the Identity and Access Server has also uh, just released a new, pr a new version of their product, IS 5.9. Um, a little bit earlier this month with some significant new enhancements around uh, programmability, around API access, and around federation, especially in a, in a um, Microsoft environment and federating with Microsoft systems. So this is a, a key aspect of our area. And we believe that just as we need to make integration better for developers, API management better for developers, we also need to make identity and access management better for developers. So that's a huge focus going forward for us. Uh, API marketplaces are our way of enabling those federated use cases. And this is an amazing example. So this is also something that happened in, in South Asia. This is an API store where we saw we, uh, the, the customer allowed lots of people to publish their APIs into a common shared API marketplace and share revenue. And this is driven by the fact that in South Asia, a lot of people don't have a credit card. So they use their mobile phone to pay for stuff. And actually, it's often in emerging countries where the, the digital expansion has grown the fastest. So I was in Kenya earlier this year, and there's something called um, M-Pasa, M-Cash, which is the world's biggest uh, mobile digital banking system. So basically, you put a mobile wallet on your phone. You don't need a bank account. And I think they put around $40 billion of value through that every single day. It's absolutely astounding. We have another customer who has enabled 25,000 small business people to set up by giving them an API-driven terminal. You go and buy this, and then you can do business and help people uh, transact deals, uh, pay for their electricity bill, pay for their mobile bill. The guy said they have people who, who sit in tops of trees because the reception is not very good. They're, they're out in the middle of nowhere in the countryside. Uh, and this is a battery-operated terminal, and the reception's better up at the top of the tree. So they, sit at the, they climb up a tree and sit there with the terminal and do business. And people have to climb up the tree to talk to them and, and say, I need to top up my mobile phone, and they do it. 
So this, this particular situation was really driven around enabling developers to build apps that use mobile wallets. And in 18 months, they onboarded 2,500 developers to build 3,500 apps. But APIs are important internally as well as externally. And, and I believe that this whole cloud native thing we've been going through is about, as I said to start with, disaggregation. So we've been disaggregating in two dimensions. We've been pulling apart the function, right? So we've been making it easier to recompose small units, microservices, serverless components, uh, APIs. And we've been pulling apart the physical deployment. So we've been first virtualizing on virtual machines, then on to cloud, then on to containers, then on to Kubernetes and, and cloud orchestration systems. Right? And this has given us cloud native. And it's great, but it doesn't completely solve the problem. So the Agile Manifesto says the best things come from self-organizing teams. Right? Uh, this is an example of self-organization in biology, which is the patterns on the back of the butterfly are actually, it's all the same cell, right? It starts out the same cell type, and somehow, as those cells develop on their wing, they self-organize into these amazing, beautiful patterns. That's pretty cool. And in, in, in our world, we all know about Jeff Bezos' two pizza rule, right? You, you need teams that, are, that can be fed with two pizzas, is his, is his law. And that's a small team. In England, where I come from, it's a very small team because we have small pizzas, right? So a two-pizza team is two people. I don't think that's what Jeff meant. You have slightly bigger pizzas here in the US. So, but we understand what you mean. You mean a team of like eight to 10 people. And there's a lot of science behind this. So firstly, there's mathematics, which is that the number of connections between different people in a team it basically goes up pretty much with n squared. So if I have 10 people in a team, there's 45 different connections between them. If I add one more person, and it's 11 people, suddenly there's 90 connections. Right? And this uh, scientist at the management department at Wharton, Jennifer Muller, basically studied this. And she identified this key concept called relational loss, which basically says, if I don't know the people I'm working with, if I don't have that core relationship with them, uh, it's more stressful for me to work with them and I'm less productive. So these teams are just fundamentally less productive the bigger they are. So what is a self-organizing team? It's basically a team that decides what it does, how it does it, organizes itself to solve the problem. And Conway's law famously said, well, you know, we, we end up with systems that mirror the teams we have. Right? He put it in a slightly more complex way. Eric Raymond, who wrote The Cathedral and the Bazaar, put it more simply. He said, if you have four teams and you're building a compiler, you get a four-pass compiler. Now, I heard about this 30 years ago when I had my first job in IT, right, working for IBM. A and I used to think, those dumb managers, right? Why can't they just solve this problem and so we can build the right technology? Well, unfortunately, 30 years later, now I'm one of those dumb managers, right? And I've realized it's not so easy to solve this. And fundamentally, you can't fight culture and you can't fight human nature, right? So which is easier? Is it easier to write code, or is it easier to change human nature? Right, it's easier to write code, right? So that's fundamentally what we need to do. We need to build our systems with an appreciation of this fundamental fact of human nature. We can't go around just fighting it and saying, Ugh, stupid human nature, right? We need to build our systems, and the problem is, it's not working. So this study from the State of Agile report said that 98% of companies have an Agile initiative that were surveyed. Only 2% didn't. 
60% said they used agile practices, right? And 96% said they're not seeing greater adaptability to market conditions. Only 4% really felt that, this was ad that they were agile to the customer because of their agile integration. So whose fault is this? It's, it's mine again. I'm sorry, guys. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not doing a very good job here, am I? So the problem is with integration and with the cross-team capabilities, I believe. So those teams are agile, but it's what happens when you cross teams, when you try and build this multi-team capabilities that we lose it. And I think what we need to do is add in another dimension into this space, which is the organizational dimension. We need to disaggregate our organizations and we need to build systems that work properly across those disaggregated organizations. So where are we with this? Well, you know, this was Uber three years ago. Said they just started their microservice journey and they said they had several hundred microservices and counting. Earlier this year at a conference, one of the Uber guys put up this, their microservices graph, right? They have disaggregated massively. There are now thousands of microservices on here. Now, if I was the CIO, I, I don't know anything about Uber's infrastructure, so I'm, I'm purely postulating here, right? But if I was the CIO of Uber, I would not look at this and think this is wonderful, right? What is the problem with this? I don't have any problem with there being thousands of dots here. It's the lines that bother me. Right? Look at these lines. They go from everywhere to everywhere. Every line here is potentially a cross-team interaction. So what does that mean? If I have a microservice here and I have hundreds of different other teams accessing my microservice, how do I communicate with them? How do I help them know that I'm going to change this? How do I deprecate it? How do I version it? How do I manage this? And so that's fundamentally where we end up with a problem with agile flow for developer teams. How do we, it's not just agi agility and flow for the developer, we need it for the team as well. And what interrupts agile flow for teams, right? Well, the first thing that interrupts it is the center of excellence model, right? So the center of excellence model says we go to the integration team to do an integration. We go to the messaging team. We go to the data team. We go to the security team. And every time we talk to another team, it's basically adding a, a waterfall process into our system. Whether or not we thought we were being agile, we suddenly got a waterfall system. One of my customers, the, the CTO at Jaguar Land Rover, calls this Wagile, right? waterfall agile. I talked to another customer the other day, and he said, ah, we call it fragile, fake agile, right? So this is a real problem. Uh, and, you know, Donnie Burkholz, who's an analyst at the 451 group, basically said, you know, you say center of excellence, I hear new silo. And that's what we've created, unfortunately. So we're trying to solve that. And we, we built this, we took some inspiration from biology. And... These are cells. So cells are the fundamental building block of every bit of flora and fauna. And what do you notice when you look at these cells? You notice the boundaries. Right? The boundaries are what you, you see. And the boundaries are fundamentally, the cell walls are what stops us just being a pile of goo on the floor. Right? But, so, so how do cell walls work? Well, there's this thing called the transmembrane receptor and signaling. So... There are enzymes and proteins that flow along the outside of the cell wall boundary, and they react with a receptor on the outside of the cell, and a signal goes through and causes some action to happen inside the cell wall boundary. So what do I see when I see this? I see an API gateway. Right? I see an event-driven system. These are events passing on the outside and hitting the uh, API gateway and, and being transferred to the inside. And so we believe that you need micro gateways and API gateways and API management around the, 
the capabilities of a team. So you need to build a set of functional units and wrap those up in a boundary where only certain events get passed. And we, we have an open source micro gateway that's very focused on developers. It basically builds Docker containers that you can deploy in your Kubernetes environment. And about two years ago, Asanka, who's going to be speaking a little bit later, and I wrote this cell-based reference architecture. And Asanka will tell you more about this. But it's fundamentally this idea that we're going to wrap up capabilities into a cell and then have a higher level construct. But without getting rid of our decentralized architecture, without getting rid of our microservices, without changing the model, without losing the agility, with, without going to a centralized layered architecture, we can build this out. And so we believe that cells are the building block of a, of a composable architecture and enterprise. And that uh, after we published this paper, we had a lot of customers say, hey, I really like this, and, and some of them are implementing it. But a lot of them said, yeah, how do I implement it? And so that was really the, the where we created Celery. And, and Asanka will tell you a little bit more about that. But once again, Celery gives you a simple code-first model with a graphical view, just like in Ballerina. And, and as, Sh as Siobhan said, we released the uh, next release of this yesterday uh, with a whole load of new capabilities, imp including improved testing, uh, stateful cells, naked cells, and all sorts of other useful stuff. And that really brings me to our, our kind of overall view. So, so I've talked about the, the need to be more, uh, to, to use APIs to build boundaries inside, to build structure to your microservices architecture. I've talked about how APIs can help you become more agile and more, dis more digitally transformed. But what we've also noticed is that if you just do the technology, it won't work. I was in Sweden, I was in Sweden uh, t not very many days ago talking with the, the company that runs all the, the, basically their version of transport for London, Vast Traffic and they run all the public transport in Gothenburg, where I was. And I showed that chart about the 4%, you know, only 4% being agile. Uh, and the chief architect said to me, she said, said it's, it's just the management, Paul. Do you know what I mean? We, we've, we've transformed into an agile organization at the lower level, but the rest of the organization is not transformed, right? So that's one aspect. But it could also be in other organizations, it's often the processes. So what we've, we've identified is a, a map of how you can transform your organization from being a monolithic, non-agile organization into something that is really adaptive and aligned with your digital transformation and aligned with your customers' needs. And how do you do that? Well, you need to move your people, processes, and technology all over further across this line. And I think what's really important is that this is, this is not about, oh, I need to just be here. This is about a journey. It's very, very important. Because there are some organizations that want to jump straight to here. They want to they've done nothing for 10 years, and now they want to jump to the future. That's going to be a big change. But there are also other organizations that understand, well, I've moved my technology along well, but I now need to move the process, and that's, that's what's holding me back. So I'm going to take a step to move myself further along here. And again, Asanka you know, is, is, the, is the mastermind behind this, and, and we'll tell you more about it. But I think this is really, really important, is to look at the holistic aspect of this. And that's really what we've tried to do with a lot of the products that we're talking about today, with Ballerina, with the micro gateway, with the new API management, with the developer-focused identity server, and with Celery. We're trying to not just look at the technology as we did with the ESB. We're trying to say, how does this fit into your organization? How does this help you align yourself with Conway's law to be productive rather than rather than fighting against it. 
So I think this is really, really important to our vision of where we're going. And, and fundamentally, I want to leave you with this, this concept that what we're after is a composable enterprise. We're after the ability to treat our whole enterprise as something that can be recomposed and composed like a, like a few microservices, except at a, at a corporate level. And that means not just thinking about technical cells, but thinking about human cells and other aspects. So that's really our future thinking in this space. <laughs>